Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. I'm Bob, uh, and I'm an alcoholic, and um, my home group is... uh, Inverness Sunday night, Step in Traditions. If you have ever passing, feel free to call in. We're currently live at Trinity Church on the banks of the River Ness. And um, it's it's a very humbling uh, privilege to come to this meeting uh, tonight. And maybe I'll, I'll explain that as, as as it goes on. And, and thanks for reminding me about uh, cross-sharing. And I'm going to apologise now. I've had four years uh, in the fellowship in the Highlands, and cross-sharing is rather endemic. And although I don't take part in it, I do get, I, I, I'm susceptible to being infected by it. And, and I'll try my level best not to do it. Uh, but I hope you understand. Uh, I avoid it, but, but I sometimes find myself uh, nowadays doing it, and I avoid it. And and the other thing as well is my share will simply be my journey and my experience, and and uh, I will make it absolutely fundamentally clear to anybody who's who doesn't see it immediately, my experience of discovering the solution to my alcoholism is based on one thing and one thing only, and it's this book and the directions and the actions that I've had to undertake in it, good and bad on occasions and mistakes that I've made. Uh, And I may not make that explicit to maybe someone new to the fellowship as I go through my story and my experience. But trust me, everything I got wrong, which I, I will share on, is down to one thing and one thing only, Bob S and my illness. Everything I've possibly got right and everything that has resulted in a positive outcome is not because of me. It's as a result of the solution contained in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the program that's, that, that's laid out in it. Uh, and I hope hope that that becomes obvious. Um, but 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 to begin with, trust me, I qualify to be here. And 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 forty decades, uh, four decades of drinking, confirms that I should not drink alcohol. My three decades of drinking confirmed that to me. And what really confirmed it to me was when I found a desire to stop drinking. And that's where my problems really started, because I discovered something rather shocking. I couldn't stop. And when I did stop, I could never remain stopped. And I suppose... That's my baseline tonight. I've stopped drinking, but I cannot guarantee that I will remain stopped. But by golly, did it take pain and confusion for me to come to that conclusion. And the methods and the ways that I tried to stop drinking um. Do you know something? If there's any newcomers or anybody interested to know my story and what I tried and how I failed, uh, I'm in the book. I'm everywhere. Just just open up the book. That will save some time on this. My feelings and my stupidity and my insanity in relation to my illness, I'm in the, the book. I'm in, I'm in it throughout. Uh, And and trust me, having been taken through it, I've identified myself at all the pertinent things. 
So I have this desire to stop drinking, and I am absolutely confused. You know, heart in heart, I knew, I knew I didn't really need to have anyone explain to me about what happened when I took that first drink. I knew. My body told me. And the compulsion and all the physical aspects of it, something told me there was something fundamentally wrong. But it was this self-will that I could fix everything that was the killer for me. And I was so deluded by the illness of alcohol that that self-determination, that self-will, and that delusion and that mental disorder was the real killer. And I didn't know what was happening to me. I didn't know what was happening to me. And, and, and to really give an example of it, I call it my Northumbria boat moment. You know, my Northumbria boat moment. I am not an Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I am on holiday in Northumbria in a seaside village called Sea Houses. And I get up into the, in the morning and I go into the bathroom to wash and shave. And I'm shaving in the mirror. Three months and 28 days without a drink. My self will. And I am at the mirror and I'm shaving and I'm going, I mustn't drink today. I mustn't drink today. Three months, 28 days, I mustn't drink today. And I'm there thinking, is this life as I knew it? Because if it is, I cannot do another day of this. And you know, the tears are washing the soap suds off my face because although I'm recounting that martyr, the, 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 this almost, not, it wasn't a prayer, I don't know whether I'm going to drink or not that day. And I don't want to face tomorrow. And I'm there on holiday with my wife and my twin daughters and and the family are on the cusp of thinking, he may have cracked it this time. They were counting the days just as much as I was. And we chartered a small fishing boat to take us to the Farne Islands just in the North Sea. And the day is like the day I, I've experienced here in, in the Highlands. The sea is a mill pond. It's sunny, it's spring. And we chug along out, out to the Farne Islands and we're floating there watching the, 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 uh, the birds and the seals. And one of my daughters crack a joke. And everybody starts laughing, throwing their heads back. And I'm there. And I can't laugh. And it's one of those moments as a father where you would want to, to coin a phrase, bottle it and take that moment to the grave. And I am engulfed in this cloud of self-pity, confusion, delusion. My past is coming back to me. I can't face another day of this. And all I want to do is jump off the boat. I cannot change the way I'm feeling. I cannot live in the moment. And yet I know I have one solution that will immediately change the way I feel. But I know I cannot take it. I see no way out. And then the greatest problem I have 
is my daughter who's cracked the joke looks at me and asks me one question. Dad, are you okay? And Bob says, of course I am, darling. I lie. Because nobody in my deluded mind will be able to understand the way I feel. I had no way out. And that today, and this is what I've learnt, so I'll sometimes put a caveat on a reflection and say what I have learnt. I'm on, by God, am I on page 52 of the big book. I'm there in that boat. I feel useless. I have problems in personal relationships. I'm of no use to anybody on that boat in my mind. They do not trust me. I keep thinking of my past. I don't know what's going to happen with my career. I am neither happy nor confident. I am useless. I'm in a spiritual malady. I'm bang in the bedevilment. And I know a solution that will get me out of that feeling, that place, and that is to to drink. And I know that if I drink, I'm not going to be able to stop. I am suicidal. I am on that boat thinking that at the end of the holiday, there is a potential that a rope in the loft is a viable solution for everybody and for me. And I'm not going to have a drink when I do it. And the holiday continued just like that. And I got home that weekend and I still didn't drink. And I was going back to work on the Monday. And on the Saturday, I it was a purgatory day because there was no way I could drink on the Saturday because I had to attend a community event in a church hall. It wasn't religious. It was a, a community event. And I had to go there to represent myself and my wife, who was in the choir. That was one of the acts singing. And I got there at 7.30. And I managed to get myself in the church because I was going to go and drink that night. And I knew it finished at 9.15, the concert. And I knew I could take the dog a walk out after the concert and go to the threshers and buy drink before 10 o'clock. So I could get through this event. And I walked into the church and I sat in the middle of the room. And I was in that malady. I was suffering from what I now know, untreated alcoholism. And as my mind focused on the threshers, my eyes focused on a young man that was on the front pew of the church. And he drew his attention to me because he didn't fit in with the audience. He wasn't the middle class, forgive me, Blue Ridge, uh, Blue Rins Brigade that were there. He was in his early 20s. He was wearing jeans, T-shirt. He had a couple of earrings, no stud, tattoos, short spiky hair. And I'm thinking, what's he doing here? But as the minutes ticked on, I couldn't take my eyes off him because he was relaxed, he was happy, he was being introduced to people, he was communicating with people. Uh, and there was something that, that just, I thought, and I'm there with a face on me like a cow chewing a thistle. And the concert started and off we went. And the third act was announced, and it's this guy. And he goes to the mic with a guitar, and he introduces himself, and he says something like, my name's so-and-so, I'm a recovered alcoholic, I haven't drunk for seven years, and I've come here tonight to sing you a few songs. And off he went with his guitar. And I sat there. And the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. And I thought, I want what that man has got. 
Now, that night, I didn't know what it was. What attracted me wasn't the fact that he hadn't drunk for seven years. It was the fact of his demeanor. And I could, didn't know what it was. I do tonight. He had sobriety. He had peace of mind. And you know something? What I didn't have was the courage to go up to him at the break and ask him how he did it. But folks, the magnetism of alcoholism, I didn't need any courage to go to the threshers at half nine and 10 o'clock and get the bottle of vodka. And that is my problem tonight. I see a solution, a potential solution to my problems. But my reaction of my alcoholism is not to grasp it with both hands when the opportunity arises. And that's what I must remember from that experience. And that led to yet one of many further hospital admissions. And after about three days and another detox, I'm thrown out and sent home. And I contact the local vicar of the church to get this guy's telephone number. She refuses to give me and says, I'll get him to give you a ring. And that man rang me, and within an hour, he was 12-stepping me in a McDonald's restaurant. And it was only then, during the course of that, that he told me he found his solution in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if that's not an example of attraction rather than promotion, I don't know what it was. And that floored me. Because for several years, I had the printed version of the 12 Steps and the AA website left most, most mornings on my bedside table. And I refused point blank to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. That man took me to my first meeting. And as a consequence, I immediately, when I walked into that meeting, saw for myself the solution on uh, offer in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that first meeting gave me what I hear time and time again was hope. What I will share is this. The next day, I recontacted that man and asked him for his help. And he offered it freely. But his solution at that point in his journey was to take me to the church he had discovered and to take me into his congregation in his church. Thank God I declined it, and thank God I went to alcohol the next meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, because what I then discovered and understand tonight, he had found the solution in Alcoholics Anonymous, but he went further, and he ended up 11-stepping himself out of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when he took me to the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that he took me to, he hadn't been to AA for a number of years. Now, he did do the right thing. He took me to AA. But that's today I understand I cannot put anyone on a pedestal as part of my solution. I need to follow the directions of the big book. And I hold on to that. And no matter what my journey is today, I must remember my obligations in, on the t t step 12. And that is to remain in the triangle and the circle of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm forever grateful to God for putting that man in my place. But it's a lesson I hold on to that that could have resulted in me walking away the next day and never returning. But I kept going to Alcoholics Anonymous and I kept making numerous mistakes. And, and one of them was the delusion and the confusion. Um, I found certain things in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous exceptionally attractive when I first arrived and, and, and other aspects of it rather confusing. And my recollections on the early days are that I saw a, a separation in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous 
and I mean this in a loving and caring way, but but at one stage in my recovery, I used to call this group of people laminators. Uh, there was a group of people that 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 were very attractive in my early days because they quoted uh, things from laminated A4 pieces of paper. And that, that seemed very, very um, attractive to me because it was a very quick solution and they were, and they were, and they were really promoting it very well. You know, um, think, think, think and, and take it easy and, and don't rush into anything, Bob, you know. Um, but what killed me was when they kept pointing at, at one of the infamous ones, don't pick up the first drink, you won't get drunk. And I'm thinking, God, please, I've been trying that one for for five years and it's it, it's not worked. And then the other group were, were a bit more calm and um, more eloquent in what, what they were saying. And they weren't particularly speaking about themselves. But I wasn't listening to these these folk because they were actually talking about the solution out, as outlined in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So my first couple of mistakes were not being able to listen to what I needed to hear. And then one of the biggest mistakes was what I was doing in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I tended to gravitate because I'm insane. And I was gravitating, particularly outside meetings, and smoking my head off with all the other insane people who were at those meetings. And, and I wasn't uh, securing anything from it. But what was happening was that the, the, these group of quieter, which I now know people who were living in the solution, were coming out and joining the smokers and kidnapping some of us. I refused to be kidnapped. But after a period of time, I was seeing the people who had been like me were now looking totally different in the manner and the approach. And these guys were also speaking about, about the solution and the fact that they had a sponsor and the fact that they were being going through the program. But Bob wouldn't let go of his old ideas. I wouldn't let go. And as a consequence... All I did was drink time and time again. The only thing I got right was that I was listening. And the more I listened, the more attractive and common sense was being made of what was being said. And I kept hearing about God and a power greater than yourself and and results coming from this. And I'm thinking, I'll never be able to achieve any of this beyond my comprehension. And then one morning at about 11 o'clock, drunk on a bottle and a half of vodka, I couldn't go on any longer. So I phoned the AA helpline. But because I'm inherently dishonest, I phoned the national number so that I wouldn't end up speaking to anybody in South Yorkshire or Rotherham. And I was just going to spew the guts and talk, which I'm very capable of doing, rubbish. And a very kind man said, I'll get someone to ring you back. And the phone rang, and it was a guy from Rotherham. And it was a guy who I had been sat next to in every meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, for six months, and who I wanted to secure the courage to ask him to sponsor me and take me through the 12 steps. And it was at that moment I realized that it was this guy that was phoning me. And we didn't speak much about the solution, clearly, because I was do lally. But when I came off that phone, drunk as I was, I thought, is this what they're speaking about? Is this God working in a funny way, this power greater than ourselves? It gave me the first chink of the potential that there might be something working in this group of drunks and alcoholics anonymous. Today, I know how that came about. You know, 12 steppers from Rotherham on the list. He answered his phone. He rang me, but the point is, it, that 
comes from him having a spiritual solution, doing service, helping other drunks, phoning somebody back, offering the, the hand of a solution, and me, drunk in my house, thinking God's at work here. Well, of course he is, because people are living a spiritual life that is there to help others. And that gave me hope. I'm conscious of the time here, but what happened then was I was taken through the program of the 12 steps by that uh, member by means of the big book. And it didn't work. And it didn't work because I didn't take it seriously. I didn't concede. And the other reason that it didn't work was I hadn't got the courage to tell him this is a matter of urgency because I'm going to drink within days. It was too slow. It was more like a big book study than it was taking me through the steps rapidly to get what I now understand is an awakening sufficient enough to relieve me of my alcoholism as it is as now. And it's irrelevant where I got in the steps, but I drank again. What is relevant is that he caught me out lying. And it was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous who wouldn't put up with that dishonesty and deceit. And he made it quite clear that we came to the end of the road. This was the first time I'd ever been sucked. And, and I use that word in a, an amusing, loving way. But it was a solitary lesson for me as being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I wasn't sacked because in the background, there was another big boot basher, to coin a phrase, who had liaised with the other one, and they agreed that the sponsorship would be handed over, providing I was willing to do it. And I remember to this day when that proposition was put to me, it was in a meeting at Wellgate on a Sunday night, Rotherham and I said Jesus Christ you're asking me to ask that man to be my sponsor if I ask him to work with me it'll be like getting on a rocking bronco and the first sponsor said Bob that's what you need and rocking bronco is still on my phone contact list today and I was all ready to go for it all ready for to go for it. And that individual came by prior appointment. That was the Sunday night. Came by prior appointment on the Tuesday night at 7.30 with another member of the fellowship. And I was asked to do but one thing. Don't drink on Tuesday. And they turned up at my house. And I had a half bottle of vodka in, in me by the time they arrived. And... Do you know something? Another lesson I learned from that. I wasn't sober, but they didn't turn their heels. They gave it a go, just for an hour. And they gave it a go. They had the big boot with them. And there were nuggets there. And the only nugget I got out of it really was powerlessness. No choice. No choice. Somebody did the hand trick. Drink everything. Which one for 30 years have you chosen? And although drunk I was, it sowed the seed. And they left. I drank again. And on the Sunday morning, I was at Saturday, I was admitted to hospital. Not drunk, but completely psychotic. And I was given... Tramadol, knocked out for 24 hours, and upon awakening, I was asked if I wanted to continue with the medical detox that I was on while I was unconscious, and I agreed, and I was left alone in the bed of the, the, the um, hospital bed. And it was that point that if, when I'm speaking to a newcomer, I say I went on steps one, two, and three immediately, I understood. And that was this decision. They could detox me until the cows came home, but there was only one thing that I knew, 
was left to my own devices, the only thing that was going to happen was I was going to drink again. And I knew I was going to drink again. Left to my own devices with no solution, I am going to drink again. And that statement that was made a number of years ago on that Sunday is as true tonight as it was then. And that is me not just admitting or accepting, I concede it, concede it. That is absolute defeated. I am defeated. I remain defeated. And I needed a power greater than myself. And for the first time in that defeated attitude, I got relief, a sense of relief. And I knew where I had to go. And arrangements were made to attend the sponsor's house on the Wednesday night, uh, sorry, the Wednesday afternoon with my big book and to start the journey, the voyage, as outlined in the text of Alcoholics Anonymous. And off I go. And I get 200 yards in the car before I arrive at that man's front door and I pull into the bus stop. And I look down at the big book and I am telling myself to turn around. I do not need to do this. What's that all about? And I clench that steering wheel and I ask the God to put the guy from the helpline onto me, the God who had made all these other people that I was now finding exceptionally attractive well to get me the final 200 yards to that door. And if I could get there, I would go for the rest of my life to any, any length to secure peace of mind and to help anyone, if only I could get there. And I got there. What I always have to remember is, why did I pull into the bus stop? Very simple. I made a decision on the Monday lunchtime and then I was wanting to turn back by the Wednesday afternoon. What was it that I got wrong between Sunday and Wednesday? Very simple. I had done nothing. I hadn't done a thing. I didn't do anything. And as a consequence, the magnetism of my illness was coming back as quickly as it went away. And that's the lesson that I hold on to tonight. Do nothing, Bob, and you will retreat back to where you came from. And I followed the program of Alcoholics Anonymous exceptionally swiftly that week, intensely, and I went through the 12 steps very, very quickly. And if there's any newcomers in the room, I do not lie now. And I will give you this utmost guarantee. As I went through that program, to one extent or another, at key moments when they are more or less likely to happen, every promise outlined in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous came into my life, my soul, and my spirit to one extent or another. And then a miracle occurred within weeks. I was shaving one morning, and I couldn't remember the last time I either thought about having a drink or not having a drink. It had gone. And it's never come back to this day. The things I got wrong in the 12 steps were all related to not following the directions. There were some things I didn't truly understand, but I was told Continue the journey and more will be revealed. The amends were a lightning. The returns were astonishing, including those that didn't go as I anticipated. One great amend I uh, learned from 
was when I do this program, I follow the directions in the big book, I take counsel from a sponsor, and I liaise with the God of my understanding, and then I go into action. I don't toddle off and then ask somebody else about doing the agreed amend. That was one of my amends that went wrong. I took the counsel of my wife, who for some bizarre reason did not want me to make amends to my daughters. And that was put in hold for six months, well, less than six months. And that was the only conflict I ever had with my sponsor, because it seemed bizarre. But then the pain was so much so that I did the amends, you know, and it, they were sterile. I got nothing from it. They were mute. They didn't say anything. And then five years later, it was disclosed to me why the amends weren't met, were, were deliberately delayed. There was a secret that wasn't meant to come out. Um, and that was a solitary lesson. The main thing that I didn't grasp, which then became beautiful, was step seven. These character traits, not defects, but these traits that are in my DNA, what's all this about them re-emerging? And within months of learning and doing step 10 and 11, trying to learn how to do step 10 and 11, I, I, at the very beginning, they were, it was very naive, uh, and I got numerous things wrong. You know, upon awakening, no, 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 I'll, I'll give it a couple of hours. Disaster, yeah? And, and sometimes I thought it was like an, I, I, I was running a Britney Spears uh, song. You know, oops, I've done it again. It was just time and time again. And then when it's pointed out, hang on, not just I've done it again. What are you getting right during the course of the day? Constructively review your day. And it says, and when these show up, so we are going to make mistakes. But I still had a lot of learning in respect of honesty. And, 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 and I thought I was honest. But fear was masking my true dishonesty and lack of ability to be honest. I didn't think I had any financial fear whatsoever. I was loaded. And then as time goes, step 10s go into step 11. There has to be more work. And it emerged that I was riddled, riddled with fear. It was impeding my full enjoyment of this program of recovery. And it was affecting the way I was showing up particularly in personal relationships. And it took two years of hard graft and learning to improve my conscious contact with God and to establish the truth and then to realize that I needed further action. And I had tried all sorts of ways, and then as time goes on, I have to man up and get the big pants on and face up to my true fears and my true problems. This is way down the line. And, and I'll share this because it's pertinent. Because I, there are elements in my recovery I remain deluded. But ca cracking on with the program of recovery allowed me to see the truth. And it was often because of exceptional pain. And I re-examined the book and I went to more big book studies and I kept this sober company of people who were following this path. And as time went on, I developed the ability to have it revealed through a variety of things, which was mainly a power greater than myself. And the conclusion was that I was hurting my wife. Irrelevant of what, what the issues were, we had fallen out of love and we had both become codependent in each other. We were grossly unhappy. And to cut a long story short, the recovered alcoholic left the marriage. 
And that engaged all the usual character traits of can't people please, going to hurt somebody versus doing the right thing. And, you know, I was playing at step 11. I was playing at improving my conscious contact with God. But the night I left that marriage, then I knew what I had to do. And that's what I did. By God, did I learn how to get on my knees and pray. And I would be doing it night after night after night. And my step 11 and my conscious contact, just by following what it says in this book, gave me prestigious results. And everything else, no matter how self-centered and self-absorbed I was at that moment, always turn and help another suffering alcoholic. I remember the night I left my marriage. I I, I uh, became a hermit in a um, in a Holiday Inn at great expense. When I left my marriage, my my daughter was but one of my daughters was present and saying, "What what are you going to do?" And I I I had a shaving bag, and I started laughing, and I said, "You know, God's given me this shaving bag, and I'm about to undertake the most expensive shave." in my entire life and we both started laughing and she said is that the only thing you're taking tonight dad i said no car keys wallet and one thing my book that's what i left with that's all i needed my book and i meditated prayed consulted and tried to do the right thing. And I continued to do that for months and months and months. And I continue to work with everybody. I'm not extolling, I'm not extolling my own virtues here. Just prior to me leaving uh, uh, South Yorkshire on that Wednesday, I had made arrangements before I had left my marriage to do another alcoholic step five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 on the Wednesday afternoon. That morning was the morning I sat down with my wife and told her that for me, the marriage was over and I was leaving. I was due to go to the Highlands and I knew that I'd be full of self-centered, self-pity and fear. What to do? Be responsible and go and experience another alcoholic's spiritual awakening by means of this program. And I sat for seven beautiful hours listening to that young man's step five. It says in the text nothing other than intensive work with another alcoholic will ensure that I don't drink but it also ensures that I'm spiritually fit. And you know something? The true nature of a fear review and a fear assessment, pulling it down, all the fears I ever have had prior to getting recovered and being recovered, guess what? The vast majority of them, to one extent or another, have all happened. And guess what? I wake up every morning, I'm still breathing, and I'm still praying to God, and all is well. They're all imaginary. And I've gone on way beyond 45 minutes. I'm just bang on 45 minutes, but I'm just going to finish off by sharing this with everybody. And it's maybe to give a bit of hope. I only came to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, to stop drinking. I never envisaged in order to stop drinking, I would have to undergo such a beautiful voyage of discovery. It wasn't on my agenda. And 
I never envisaged that I would have this life. And I have. I never envisaged that part of the solution would to be finding a fellowship of people, a power greater than my, myself, and adopting a manner of living where I engage human beings and to be of help to anybody that I may come into my path. And all I had to do was follow the directions. And I still struggle, but just try and try my best. And the more I try, the better my best gets to a degree in one way or another. And to find a loving God as I understand that loving God. My loving God has a self-deprecating sense of humor. He will, if I don't do something I should do, my loving God will ensure that I come to some sort of silly, calamitous, amusing difficulty. And I laugh with him. But I still, you know, at times will not do what I've got to do. I'll give you the final example of what I'm meaning. When I came, I was asked to believe are asked to believe that I may be a possibility that I will discover a power greater than myself, just a belief, and to give it a go and see what happens. I'm summarizing it in my own words. Just a belief. At that time, my belief was based on all the other people who had taken the same position, and they were all saying, trust us, Bob. You will be at one, be able, at one stage be able to trust in God. But I had to have a bit of faith and belief to begin with. I remember in the early days of leaving South Yorkshire, I had to make arrangements to to see a divorce solicitor. I knew who they were. And it was a nightmare to arrange that appointment. It was a nightmare to arrange that appointment. I was with their clerk and we made several attempts and it had changed over a fortnight. But the appointment came and it was a, a Tuesday or something in, in Sheffield High Street and the office is there. And I am full of fear. I am alone. I am nervous, I have that feeling of of uselessness, powerlessness, but I am agitated and I'm worried. And, you know, I won't go to the solution, will I? Uh, The appointment's at 11 o'clock and at half past eight, I'm opposite the offices of the solicitors in a Starbucks. And for some reason, a liter liter of black Americano and treble shots and 10 Benson and Hedges are not hitting the spot. And I then realize you're going to have to meditate and make conscious contact with the God of your understanding where to go, because it can't happen in Starbucks. And I think of Sheffield Library, the, the botanical gardens. And, you know, something told me, no, Bob, it's not got resonance. You need something with a bit of residence and gravitas. And I look out the window and I say, Sheffield Cathedral. And I go into that cathedral and I haven't got my big boot with me, but I've got enough understanding is to try and follow various prayers and to try and speak with God. I've no idea of what I was saying or doing or thinking, but when I came out, I do know one thing. It's the first chapter and how it works. Is it three or four times it says honesty, honesty, honesty? And the only response I got from the God of my understanding was go in there, speak to that solicitor, bear your, uh, bear your soul, tell the truth, say it how it is, especially about your fears. And I went in for the appointment and it was two, a two hour appointment. And that's exactly what I did. And at the end of the uh, consultation, she said, I've got several questions for you. Uh, You've nothing to worry about. Uh, That's my job. Uh, Your fears about bankruptcy. um, Absolutely fanciful, Bob. Unreal. Well, I've heard that before. Um, And then she said, you've listed all your assets here, Bob. but 
there's one asset I've written down and I can put a value on it, but I need clarification. And she said, that asset is your sobriety. That asset, your greatest asset is your sobriety. And she said, for the purpose of the proceedings, I need your sobriety date. And that threw me because, one, I had forgotten it. And two, it was a long, long time. I stopped counting the days. And I said, I'm going to have to look at my phone. It's on, my, it's on an app. And she said, fine, go ahead. And I opened up the spiritual toolkit. And I looked at the date. And that's the date I was sat, laid in that hospital bed. I looked at the date. And yet again, the hairs stood up on the back of my neck. This random solicitor's appointment was on my sobriety date, the 19th of April. Two hours before that, the solution of the book of Alcoholics Anonymous took me to the true solution, a power greater than myself, who I had sat down with and tried to make conscious contact with God. It's then revealed to me that my greatest asset is my membership and of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. My solution lies upon it, and I'm there on my sobriety date, more or less 11 o'clock, the hour I made a decision that I remain powerless over alcohol, that I am unable to manage for my own life, that only a power greater than myself will restore me to sanity. And at that moment, that changed. I knew that if I remain doing what I do, I can trust God, providing I clean house and help others. And I pray that I'm given the opportunity to continue the voyage. The only person who will stop that happening is Bob S. in Inverness. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.